Well, the, the definition, it's not in the notes, but the definition that, ev- that uh, Jesus, Paul, John, and then later, St. John of the Cross and many others, St. John of the Cross wrote a lot about this subject. Um, you might not know it. He was writing about detachment. We'll talk about that at the very end. But it's connected to covet- covetousness. The Desert Fathers wrote extensively about it. It's called avarice. The, uh, the definition that everybody's working from, Exodus 20, 17, of course, one of the Ten Commandments, the, that we would not covet our neighbor's wife, that we would not covet our neighbor's house, that we would not covet the, the manservant, the maidservant, that we would not covet their possessions. The, the commandment in Exodus is about not seeing something that God has given someone else. God, God's given them something. Not seeing that which God has given them, and in our soul, a demand emerges that that which God has given some, someone else is actually rightly ours. That's covetousness. That it should be ours. That when the, when the Desert Fathers wrote about it, they wrote about it as rooted in insecurity and anxiety. In other words, there's a, there's a deep fear at the root of covetousness related to our resource, our position, our sense of security. We're operating from an unstable place of uncertainty related to the Lord's leadership. That's one of the things that would cause your soul to rise up, to see something that someone else has, to see something that someone else has been given. Position, influence, not just money. Position, influence, promotion, to see something that someone else has been given, likely by God, not always, but likely by God, but still to say within your own soul, that's rightly mine. But that, that, that's mine, the lust that's driving that statement is born out of fear and anxiety and insecurity. I don't feel secure in my future. I don't feel secure in provision. I don't feel secure related to, I don't feel successful related to what I'm doing and what I'm giving myself to. And so that's the, the definition that they're working off of, one of the commandments from Moses. I want to talk about for a moment, in page one of the notes, why talk about covetousness? Why am I talking about this? There's four things, four reasons to talk about this, and I hope we talk about this many more times in the days to come. Letter A, covetousness is likely the sin most committed. In the evangelical church, there's like three or four sins that are always highlighted. You'd think there were only three or four sins. But the problem is when you continually preach against those same three or four sins and never preach and teach related to one of the big ones, you're accidentally, you're, you're uh, unconsciously allowing for the proliferation of that sin. If it's never in a, in a righteous way, if it's never with tenderness and mercy identified, defined, talked about, there's very little context for that, those moments that I'm talking about, the, the revelation that leads to resolution. The, the, I, I love the, the sweetness of simple repentance when the Lord from His Word makes sin make sense without condemnation and invites us to go, no, I don't want that in my life. I don't, I don't want that there. I don't like that that's there. I can see it now. I don't want that there. And then that, that sweetness of confession. We don't have to make a huge deal. We don't have to rend our garments. The sweetness of confession can be grabbing a friend and going, man, that sermon the other night, I was so convicted. Just pray for me real quick. I just want that out. Or it's in that moment when it's hitting me going, ah, I don't, I don't like that. Hey, pray for me real quick. I just want to, I just want to not, I don't want to walk in this. I don't want any agreement in this area. We're not, if we're not equipped by the teaching of the Word to respond with repentance when we see it in our lives, it's going to proliferate. It's going to, it's going to increase in, in our lives and abound in our lives. That's why I call this likely the most committed sin in the Western world. 
Because who's, who's pointing at it? Who's calling it out? It's the least talked about from the pulpit. I mean, I'm walking up here to talk about this, and that's the first thing Mike said. Wow, no one talks about this. The, the problem is the subject of covetousness. When you're talking about money, fulfillment, how we understand God's provision, how we understand God's leadership of our lives. These are the, some of the core issues of our life, some of the core issues of our identity in Christ. And so we want to not just have an altar call tonight, we want to set ourselves up to repent our way out of this over the next decade and beyond. The, uh, the likely lifelong struggle of that lust of the flesh that rises up, that wants more outside of the will of God. And so the, my goal, and I said this to the students on Monday night, and you'll see why I preach this message to the students on Monday night in a minute. The, the goal isn't just a momentary conviction. The goal is just remembrance, days, weeks, years from now, where we just remember the truth of God's word around this subject and we just repent again. Just We repent again, we repent again in sweet, small, profound, and powerful ways. It's crucial to do so, to repent our way out of the restlessness of covetousness, the restlessness of it. To do that over time is critical to lay hold of the fullness of Jesus, the fullness of delight and joy in this life, in this age. I'm going to say something bold. I believe it's not possible to lay hold of the fullness of God that we can have by His grace in this age if we don't declare war on covetousness. Why? Because it's the poison that kills the satisfaction and pleasure that we find in communion with Christ. Unfulfillment, that is that restlessness that distorts the cry of there must be more. Restlessness, unfulfillment turns that from there must be more of the beauty of Jesus to experience. There must be more of the love of Jesus to touch. Unfulfillment and covetousness distort the cry of there must be more to there must be more influence. There must be more recognition. There must be more honor. There must be more security and safety. There must be more ministry, which again, it's not that we're against more, or I'm against more ministry. I'm against selfish ambition and vain conceit. I'm against the ways in which we spiritualize covetousness and turn the object of our more from Jesus to ministry, and we're headed for disaster when we do that. For the Sunday morning crowd, it may be there, there must be more vocational success. There must be more promotion. There must be more leadership. There must be more recognition of my giftings. That which is talked least about by the Western world, Jesus talked the most about. That's my second reason, letter B. Jesus talked the most about this subject. This was really serious to him. He really cares a lot that we have victory in this area because he understands that core issue in Matthew 6, that core issue of light on the inside, our whole body being filled with light, that vibrant interior life, the sustained walk. When I think of a vibrant interior life, I'm thinking of a flowing heart. I'm thinking about tenderness on the inside. I'm thinking about receptivity to the Spirit and His Word. I'm thinking about responsiveness to it. There's lots that I'm thinking about when I think about a vibrant interior life. But, but all of that to me is wrapped up in the urgency to develop a sustained walk with Jesus that can endure pain, that can endure difficulty, that can endure mistreatment, loss, suffering, hardship, 
a sustained walk with Jesus that can bear the weight of where this world is going. To me, covetousness robs us of the spiritual vitality and perspective that we need to bear up under the difficulties that lay ahead. We want Jesus, and we, I know we want this. We want Jesus to be the great treasure of our heart. I mean, we're intercessory, intercessory missionaries. We give our life to a prayer room to, to talk to Jesus about America, to talk to Jesus about our families, to talk to Jesus about our city and the church, the beautiful bride. So I know we want this. What Jesus wants is to grow as the treasure of our heart. That as we treasure him, we would delight in that he delights in our weakness. We would delight in his great mercy, his kindness and tenderness. But the subject of covetousness extends beyond those truths and it extends into the subject of the beauty of his careful, detailed leadership of our lives. We rightly, it's his kindness that leads us to repentance. We love his tenderness. We love his mercy. We love his kindness. We love his humble zeal for partnership and the way that he engages with us with such joy and interest and, and delight. We love that. But it's when we run into his leadership over our lives that we chafe. And we, we it's the... That's where the collision is, and that's where the battle of covetousness begins. The subject, not just of his beautiful attributes, but the subject of his beautiful leadership. Do we delight? Do we love? Do we rejoice? Do we dialogue with him in a tender way filled with gratitude related to the specifics of his leadership over our life, and I'm talking about that which he gives to us and that which he withholds from us. Do we delight in what he withholds, not just what he gives? Do we delight in what we receive from him and do we delight in that which he is not giving us yet? Because when we delight in that, we're delighting in his wisdom, but covetousness and unfulfillment fuel that discontentment from insecurity. It's the same discontentment and insecurity you can find in Genesis 3. There's, there must be more is misdirected. Rather than there must be more of the beauty of God, there must be more that you're withholding from me that would make my life better. Covetousness, letter C, there's the third reason we need to talk about this more. This is a big one. They're all big. That it's important to Jesus is probably the biggest. Probably should have been the number one reason. Covetousness and unfulfillment are the primary drivers of the love of money and the coming of the harlot Babylon. That's the great shock of Revelation 17 and 18. The, when you read the book of Revelation, you're waiting for the bad guy, the ultimate bad guy, to be the serpent, or you're waiting for the ultimate bad guy to be the Antichrist. And the, you know, the Bible shows us the devil early on, and the Bible shows us the Antichrist. Revelation, it shows us the Antichrist early on, and we're like, yeah, okay, now we know. That's our enemy in the end times. We're going to oppose the Antichrist. And the Lord goes, wait, I haven't told you the whole story yet. Who? Oh, I mean, the Antichrist is pretty bad, and he's got like the throne of Satan and the authority over demons, and he's got the armies, and he's got the economy, and he's got the worship, and he's got the politics, and he's got the resource. I mean, this guy is a real intense foe, and, and the, the, you know, the, uh, the real author of the book of Revelation, John is a scribe, the real author of the book of Revelation goes, yeah, but how did he come into power? What? Who? Well, how did the Antichrist come into power? And we go, oh, the, the sovereignty of God. Yes, the sovereignty of God in relationship to what? Oh, what do you mean? So then Revelation 17, 18, the Lord pulls the curtain aside and shows us the real bad guy of the story, the real villain. The real villain is, well, us, the human race. It's, in other words, a, a global principality and a historically, globally empowered, demonized man 
are set into power by greedy, lust-filled, wicked men, empowered by the people behind them. Why? Because the question is, the question of Revelation 17 and 18, the underlying question, how far will men go in their pursuit of riches? Who would they enthrone? What compromises are they willing to make? What backroom deals are they willing to sign? What wicked men are they willing to put into power to ensure that the world that they've built continues on without interruption, continues on without interference? In other words, if you have unprecedented human power, wealth, influence. You've, you've figured out the rules of a wicked game. That's the dynamic of a fallen world. That's the dynamic of a, of a Romans 1 world. If you want to, you can figure out the rules of a wicked game and climb to the top of a dark ladder of power and corruption, and you can benefit greatly from exploiting the world as it is for personal gain. Once you get there, you can build the world that you want. You can shape society in the way that you want to ensure that you and your children keep what you've gained. James talks about that in, in his letter. James talks about the way in which we, we lust and war to get and we lust and war to keep. The book of Revelation is that on a global scale. We lust and war to get. We lust and war to keep. That's what Revelation 17 and 18 is in its simplest form. They lusted and warred to lay hold, and then they lusted and warred to keep what they gained and built a world to ensure that they could keep it. But here's the problem. They have to make a literal deal with the devil. They have to enthrone a demonized man to because they think he's the key. He's the man of promise to hold off the Psalm 2 anointed one appointed by Yahweh, God of Israel. God goes, you imagine that you can keep what you've gained and you imagine that you can maintain the world as it is, but my people are contending for the world as I want it to be. I've launched a prayer and worship movement to contend for the downfall and the deconstruction of the world that you've built so that the world that I made could be as I desire. I mean, we're going to preach the gospel of the kingdom everywhere. We're going to tell them that. That's the incredible thing about God. That's the beautiful thing about Jesus is he raises up intercessors. He raises up worshipers. He raises up messengers. And then he says, hey, I'm about to do something. Go tell them what I'm about to do. Aren't they going to stop you? No, read Isaiah 40. They're grasshoppers. Go tell the grasshoppers what I'm about to do. Well, why are we telling them? We'll tip them off. We'll get them mad and they'll probably kill us. They will kill you, but also some will repent. <laughs> Number one, under letter C, in Revelation 4, verses 10 through 11, this is important. The 24 elders around the throne, they're casting their crowns down before the throne. It's not just humility at work. Think about this. Why are they casting their crowns down? They're making a declaration. It's in the opposite spirit of what I'm describing. It's in the opposite spirit of Psalm 2. When the Psalm 2 kings and the Revelation 18 merchants, through the gospel of the kingdom with signs, wonders, and a global outpouring of the Holy Spirit, when the Psalm 2 kings and the Revelation 18 merchants are informed by the messengers of the gospel of the kingdom that the anointed one has been chosen by the Father and he's coming to take possession of his inheritance, the nations. When they are informed, they rage. They throw their crowns on and they say no. They declare this world that we have built is rightfully ours. But the 24 elders... We open the throne room of heaven with a scene of 24 elders casting their crowns down and declaring, in essence, 
No, this world that you have made, they appeal to God, creator of heaven and earth. They go, this isn't ours. We didn't make it. We claim no right to this. We're casting our crowns down, not just because we're humble and awestruck. We're casting our crowns down before the God that made all this. That's what it says. You made this. Therefore, it's rightfully yours. It's fully yours. When they cast their crowns down, they're saying, this is not ours. It's yours. They're modeling for us as men. They're modeling as humans, as representatives of the human race. They're modeling for us, going into the drama of Revelation, the spirit, the way in which we're to conduct ourselves and carry our hearts. We're about to walk into something cataclysmically destructive. We're about to walk into a collision between the rage of men, the rage of Satan. They want to keep the world as it is and the wrath of God, but filled with mercy, but the wrath of God with zeal and commitment to not leave the world as it is. That is a collision, and as we come to that collision, it's critical that the saints aren't holding on to personal rights, that the saints aren't holding on to unfulfilled personal dreams that God didn't birth. It's critical that we come into it with the abandoned faith and trust in his leadership that says, this world is yours, it's not mine. This, the nations are yours, they're not mine. My life is yours, it's not mine. Therefore, spend me as you will, send me where you will, tell me what to say, I will go where you send me and do what you tell me. And I won't complain. I didn't make me, you did. But covetousness changes that conversation. You are my maker, therefore do what you will. Covetousness changes the conversation to, I have rights, I want what I want. I want what's mine. Which brings us to the fourth reason why I want to talk about this. Letter D. The reason I talk about the end times isn't just because it's interesting mysteries to unravel. I talk about the end times because the issues of sin and glory, the issues of the, the Holy Spirit and power, the issues of sin and compromise, the issues of repentance, the beauty of Jesus, the, you get the clearest picture of what is right now in seed form by seeing the clearest picture of where it's going. I like looking at the end because I can get a real clear view of where we're at. I can see the continuity between the two. Jude called us to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. The question we want to ask, what expression of our faith will we hand to the next generation? The next generation of believers, the Call them whatever you want. I don't personally like Gen Z because they're going to be like 30 soon. I like just praying for teenagers personally because if you pray for teenagers, you always pray for teenagers. If you pray for Gen Z, they're 30 and unfulfilled in a minute. But that's just me. I know it's taken hold. I'm kicking against the goads here, but I'm nothing if not petty. Our story... Our story of Christianity is the story of what we willingly lose to gain everything in Christ. If our gospel, if our faith, if our expression of love for Jesus has become distorted by our culture, which I am suggesting that it has, if it's become distorted by our culture, and if that distortion has long gone unaddressed, then we're handing the next generation a distorted, me-centered expression of faith built on my personal rights, not built on sacrificial love. The faith that's been handed to us by our fathers. We are fighting a war to reclaim it, and we're fighting a war to hand that. But the war that we're fighting isn't against the denominations and preachers and whoever, we're not fighting that war against them to do better. We're fighting the war on the inside to repent our way into something. I can't 
figure out what they're doing and what they're saying and what they're teaching. I can only do by the grace of God and serve by the grace of God in the context of where he's planted me. And so we get to deal with us. We get to talk to us. We want to lay hold of for this spiritual family and for those that are running with us in, a, in the international family of affection, for those that are saying yes with us, together we're addressing us and we're looking to reclaim a sacrificial faith that really embraces the cross of Christ of which nothing that he asks is too much. The culture of covetousness emboldens entitlement, fuels unfulfillment, and it robs us of the very power of the cross that brings us into true fullness and rest. Because fullness and rest thrive where confidence in Jesus' leadership is. And confidence in Jesus' leadership thrives where we're fulfilled, where we're satisfied, where we're not aching for more recognition, but we're longing for more beauty. Now, 1 John 2, 15 to 17. Do not love the world or the things in the world, anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father's not in them, for everything in the world. These are the key phrases I want to focus on. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires will pass away. They will pass away. Whoever does the will of God lives forever. That's the, I mean, if you want the bottom line here, the bottom line here is simplicity of heart, simplicity of lifestyle, empowering simple obedience from a place of delight and devotion. This is really small. Covetousness, I, I'm, I'm convinced that the bigness of American ministry, the bigness of American ministry impact, the bigness of American ministry platforms. It, I am convinced it's smoke and fog. It is unreality. It is unhealthy. It is not what we're to be about. We're to be about the smallness of the simplicity of obedience to what Jesus asks us. Now, if he asks us to step onto a stadium platform and say words then do it. The point isn't the size of the platform. The point is obedience to the one you love that asked you to say the words. The, uh, that bigness. I, I've been interacting with some leaders and I'm, I'm kind of thrown off by it. I know I shouldn't be thrown off by it. I don't want to be thrown off by it but I'm a little thrown off by it. It's, we've just entered this moment in American ministry where nobody leads ministries anymore. I don't know if you've noticed this, but it seems like nobody leads ministries anymore. Everybody's got a movement. It's like, hey, what do you do? Well, I'm from Boise. I lead a young adult movement. What's it called? Well, this is the title of it. And what do you guys do? We have Sunday morning services. We have Wednesday night services. We have small groups. So it's a church no, it's a young adult movement. <laughs> Why does it have to be a movement? Is it because when you were 20, you longed to be in a ministry to make impact and be used by God to impact your generation? And then when you were 30, you got what you were longing for. You're leading a ministry. And then you discovered, oh my gosh, this is boring. <laughs> this is incredibly small. This is incredibly thankless. People are incredibly complex. People are incredibly hard to navigate, and I'm not good at the complexity, and I don't know what to do, and this isn't what I thought it'd be, and I gave up my 20s, and this was my dream, and I've arrived at my dream, and it's super duper boring and hard. And so it's almost like we use exaggerated language to justify the sacrifice. We don't say, the Lord's asked me to pastor this little church. We don't say, the Lord's entrusted me with a couple people to disciple. We don't say, I delight 
to move his heart and what he's asked me to do. We don't say that. We say, well, you know, I'm part of this just movement. It's a movement. It's a movement. Man, what a movement. It's such a movement. I, yeah, I, it may be. It can be. But does it have to be? In other words, is it, a, is it a movement because God is doing something bigger than you? Or is it a movement because you need to be a part of something bigger? To justify the choices you've made, the life that you lead, the sacrifices that are a part of it, and the utter difficulty that makes it hard to get up in the morning and do it. Just that, it's that American culture of big, that Western culture of big, that Western culture of influence and impact. And social media doesn't help. The love of the world to take our eyes off of Jesus, to wish and long for the things we lack, is to refuse to set our mind on things above, but we've set our mind on an earthly target related to our own insecurity, related to our own unfulfillment, related to our own sense of success, related to our own sense of what makes it worth it. We sing continually about the superior pleasures of the kisses of his word on our hearts. We sing continually about the one that satisfies, the word coming alive in our heart that satisfies far beyond wine and the pleasures of this world. That's what we're after. That's what we're pursuing. We want that to be real, that the word kissing our heart truly would be the satisfaction, the, the job well done, the it's worth it. We're doing this. But, but the problem is the lust of the flesh. Romans 7, 7 through 12, I'm just going to point at it. When Paul's talking about the way that sin works and the way that sin works in relationship to the law, Paul uses covetousness as his case study. I find that interesting. The way he talks about the way in which sin exploits the law to produce, and this is the key phrase, all manner of evil desires. That's the way that, that's the way that it works. When we, without grace, when we approach the law and try to keep it, our flesh is activated in that area. Why is our flesh activated within that area? It's what I talked about earlier. Without grace, without the interior Holy Spirit, without his help, without his tenderness, without his responsiveness, when we run into the law, when we run into that which we should be doing without grace, we're running into past the attributes of God and his tenderness, kindness, and mercy his love, his affection, we're running past that and we're running into the way that tenderness is expressed in detailed leadership. It's a boundary that he's setting in his loving care and we're running into that boundary and our flesh is saying, no, and that's what Paul is describing for us. The way that sin and law work together as sin, flesh, rages against law because of that mystery of iniquity, because of that hidden no in the human heart against God's leadership. We want the tenderness and the grace and the forgiveness and the mercy and the kindness. We want the, the benefits and the pleasures, but we also want what we want and we want to do what we want to do and we want to do it when we want to do it. We want to be the rudder of our own ship, determining our own course, going where we want to. And then God suddenly puts law in place and a boundary and we run into it and we go, ah, oh, I don't like this. I don't, I don't like this. And the Lord with such kindness, he's so gracious. He goes, I, I know you, you really, really don't like my leadership. You don't. You like my kindness. You like my mercy, but you don't like my wisdom as it's applied to the boundaries of your life. And so the lust of the flesh is what gets activated when we hit a boundary. We hit our resource boundary. We hit our influence boundary. We hit our you know, promotion, our authority. We hit our leadership boundary. We hit our calling boundaries. We, we, your honor boundaries, your security boundaries, your safety boundaries. We hit those boundaries. Our sensibilities and God's sensibilities are very different. Where we feel safe and where he feels safe, very different. And so when we hit our safety sensibilities, God's going, you're good, you're doing this. And we're going, no, this isn't safe. 
We feel fundamentally insecure related to his leadership. We don't feel safe like we want to. We don't like how he's leading us. We're not recognized like we want to be. We don't like how he's leading us. When we say those leaders, ultimately deep down what we mean, those leaders don't notice me. Those leaders don't pick me. Those leaders don't recognize me. What we're really ultimately saying deep down from a place of honest hidden covetousness, what we're really saying is, I need those leaders to recognize me, to feel successful at what I'm doing. Why aren't you showing me to them? Why aren't you highlighting me? Holy Spirit, why aren't you highlighting me? Why am I hidden to them? We resent them related to missed opportunity, or we resent them related to missed honor. We resent them related to missed provision. We resent them, but deep down who we really resent, we know who to really blame for it. We know where our provision comes from. It doesn't come from our leaders. It doesn't come from our bosses. It doesn't come from our employers. We know that ultimately our provision comes from God. We know where to rest the blame. That's what the lust of the flesh does. It just activates blame. Think about that. The lust of the flesh, when you think about it that way, it becomes much more serious. Do not love the world. For the lust of the flesh is at work. We're like, whoa, what's that? Well, it's that moment where you run into your contempt for God's leadership and your contempt is activated in restlessness. Oh, that sounds bad. It is bad. But John continues. He goes, but... When the lust of the flesh is activated, you don't like the boundary you're running into. You don't like the lack. You don't like the the way in which your life isn't working the way you want it to. The world that you want to build isn't being, God's not cooperating. Why aren't you cooperating? I'm cooperating with you. Why don't you cooperate with me? John goes, yeah, but then there's the next step, the lust of the eyes. The lust of the flesh is that general restlessness and angst and insecurity But then the lust of the eyes, you see something and that becomes the object. That becomes what you fixate on. That. You have a general contempt of God's leadership. The lust of the eyes takes your general contempt of God's leadership and makes it specific. I don't like God's leadership. And then your eyes see something. In that area. I don't like that specifically. I want a better this, I want more that. I want better this, I want better that. I want this to work better. And your your eyes have locked in on something specific to blame God for related to your lack. And then Paul says next is the pride of life. The pride of life then, after you're generally angsty, insecure, and offended with God and his leadership, the eyes have locked in on what you want that you're, that, that's being withheld from you. You're being denied something. Let me, let me uh, I want to say that from the notes in letter C. We've set our course according to our restless, unfulfilled desires, zeroing in on what our eyes see, as the source of our angst. We, we pointed it right there. We got it right there. God, that's what it is. That's what it is. I couldn't quite figure out why I was bugged by you before, but now I see it. It's that. You're denying me that, and I'm mad at you. Of course, we never say it that. We're, we're more skillful at self-deception than that. And that's where the pride of life comes in. The pride of life If we said it in the obvious ways, we would bust ourselves. We'd go, wait, what am I doing? Oh, this is wrong. No, I don't don't want that, God. I'm way above that. I don't care. I've talked about this before. I have, as have you, probably had many of those moments where you're going, I don't care. I don't want that. That's not godly. I don't care about such things. And my heart's like, you're a liar. (laughs) I want it so badly. I want it bad. Quiet heart, this is wrong. Biblically, I do not care about such things. And the heart's like, yeah, you do. (laughs) Oh, you do. You super duper care. The 
That's not, self-denial isn't the moment where I look at my heart and go, shut up and get in line. Self-denial is the moment that I look to Jesus and ask him to change my heart. It's where I acknowledge it. I go, wait, I'm just realizing the way my heart's acting up, I do want that. Help me, Lord. Change my wayward heart. Change my stubborn heart. I need your help right here, right now. It's surfaced. I tried to be more godly than the sin that surfaced, but it's real and I want your help. But instead, because we've gotten this far in the journey without the Holy Spirit, we want to continue the journey without the Holy Spirit. And that's where the pride of life kicks in. It's now we've gotten to the point in the journey where instead of going, wait, I don't like this. I don't want this. I, I genuinely want to align with your word, but I can't because my heart's a mess. Help me. Instead of bringing God into the conversation, instead of bringing the Holy Spirit into the fight, instead of doing that, pride of life causes us to begin to self-justify our angst. The pride of life begins to give in to entitlement, to get bolder in our objections to God's leadership, to give permission. We give ourselves permission. No, it's right. It's right that you want that. You've been serving here for so long. No, this is, this is, I've had enough. I've been here so many years and no one's ever said, you know, thank you. It, I need that. I deserve that. And the Holy Spirit's going, please bring me into this conversation. You are headed for disaster. Please bring me in. I want to talk with you about this. But you seem content to only talk with you about this. And you talking to you about this is a disaster, I assure you. <laughs> Think about everything I'm saying. Think about what I'm talking about fueled by social media, fueled by Instagram, TikTok. Think about what I'm talking about. If, if it's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, and they work together to embolden our accusation against God's leadership to fuel covetousness, I mean, think about that. Add social media. Think about the restlessness, the discontentedness, the insecurity that now sees unprecedented options. I was happier, Romans 7, when I didn't know all that I was missing out on. It was easy to sing worthy, worthy of it all when I thought I was missing out on a slightly better car, an extra bedroom house. But now I see the options. Now I see how the other half lives. Now I see what's out there. I mean, our culture, Western culture, the rage related to the options and what's being denied me. Let's look at, uh, let's skip ahead to Roman numeral three. We got a little bit of time left. First Timothy six is a really important passage. Again, there are 20 passages that we could look at on this subject. The New Testament has an uncomfortable amount of stuff to say about covetousness. It only magnifies the weight. If the New Testament has this much to say, why aren't we talking about this more? First Timothy six I want to say this, it's in letter A. This conversation that Paul's having with Timothy, what he's writing here, it's actually in the context of the workplace. It's in the context of the workplace because he starts out by talking about bond servants and masters. He says, this is the way we want to conduct ourselves. We want to not see them. Paul's already putting in place the, the safeguards against covetousness related to our bosses, related to our leaders. He's going, no, don't see them as your way to more honor. Don't see them as, don't live for the person you're working for. Do all, do all things. Do your work. Do your job as unto the Lord. Don't live for the person you're working for. Don't try to get them to notice you more. Don't try to get them to see how gifted you are, or what a faithful contributor you are, or how great you are contributing to the bottom line. Don't advertise yourself to them. If you advertise yourself to your leaders, your bosses, 
It's going to lead to such envy, he goes on to say. It's going to lead to such strife. It's going to open the door to much discontentment and frustration. You're going to make your boss an idol related to your fear about provision, and you're going to end up resenting them, and it's going to destabilize the whole community. I mean, Paul says it's strong. He goes, what I just said, if anyone teaches otherwise... If anyone says anything different than what I just said, if they don't consent to wholesome words, if they don't even consent to the words of Jesus, because Paul's just referencing the Sermon on the Mount, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, then that man is proud, knowing nothing, obsessed with disputes, arguments over words, with Envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of man. Paul goes, it's useless. The things they're wrangling for, they're wrangling for more honor. They're wrangling for more provision. They're wrangling for more recognition. They're wrangling for more ministry. They're wrangling for more impact. It's useless. They're striving in their own strength to build the life that they dreamed of, and they never consulted the Holy Spirit or the Jesus of the cross related to what he wants their life to be. He understood the relationship between covetousness, unfulfillment, and a destabilized, toxic community of believers. In the workplace, unhealthy and sinful ideas about provision, promotion, and more can foster envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings. The core issue of the toxicity is the distorted idea that godliness is a means of personal gain. That's the the core of the toxicity, the poison. The poison that poisons our delight in Jesus. The poison that poisons our delight in one another as we fellowship with the Lord and one another. There's a poison that poisons the well of our fellowship, and that poison is the idea that godliness is a means of personal gain. That if I do the time, if I'm faithful, if I show up, if I serve, if I do the Sermon on the Mount, I will be blessed in this life with more material possessions. I will be blessed in this life with human promotion. I will be blessed in this life with recognition, with compliments. I will be blessed, in other words, The personal gain is the goal of our godliness. And Paul goes, that creates so much strife, envy, dissension, toxicity. That's poison to your spiritual community. Paul goes, there's an alternative. The way to great gain, he says. I love that phrase. There's a way to great gain. If we go a different way, it's godliness with contentment. Oh, I love that phrase. Godliness with contentment. The great gain is twofold. The great gain is found in the things that we avoid when we break break free of covetousness. By going the way of godliness with contentedness, we avoid competition, temptation, a snare. We avoid many foolish and harmful lusts that drowned men in destruction and perdition. The great gain is we avoid that way, the covetousness. Covetousness, like a snare and a noose, drags us that way because that's where our heart takes us if undealt with. Again, I'm going to be bold. If you want to have an angst about the condition of a church or a, or a body of believers or a community of faith, if you want to have an angst, look at covetousness and the poison that's dragging Sincere people, but undealt with issues related to covetousness. These are strong words. Verse 9, temptation and a snare, foolish, harmful lusts that drown men in destruction and perdition. The great gain is that in that which we avoid, and the great gain is now found in that which we are now free to pursue. When you're free of covetousness, when you're free of unfulfillment, You are now free in a new way to pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. Here's the strong inference that Paul is making here. 
The implication is the virtues we're free by grace to pursue cannot thrive in a context of mixture. Sincerity of the pursuit of godliness and righteousness and faith, love, patience, gentleness, the sincere pursuit of those things with the mixture of covetousness and unfulfillment, the mixture is actually toxic to the pursuit of those things. That is the whole point of Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount related to the Beatitudes. Letter C, Paul talks to the wealthy. He didn't condemn the wealthy in this present age, but he exhorted them to humility and to not trust in their riches. To go, wait, be humble related to your riches because you didn't get that because you're gifted and smart. You got that because God has a purpose for you related to good works. You have as much of an opportunity in your wealth to store up treasures in heaven as any saint on the planet that takes the Sermon on the Mount seriously and the exhortation to seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and everything else is added. Something's been added to you for a sovereign purpose. Don't get haughty about that. So he doesn't condemn the wealthy for having wealth. He just says, be careful. Carry your heart well related to it and how you see yourself. Don't see your wealth as a means to exaggerate yourself, but see your wealth as an opportunity for treasures in heaven. Paul wrote about contentment. In whatever state I am, Philippians 4, 11 through 13, a simplicity of heart to rejoice. This is where we want to go. We want to be thankful. We want to be, we want to have gratitude. But more than that, we want to rejoice in the wisdom of his leadership. Simplicity of heart. God, whatever you give me or whatever you don't, whatever you give me or whatever you withhold, I'm going to trust that you're really good at this. I'm going to trust that when it comes to the details of my life, you're really excellent and really concerned with who I'm becoming and loving you. You're really concerned about it. I'm going to trust that what you give and withhold is connected to your just joyful jealousy for my future with you. That simplicity of heart. I trust you, God. Letter E, St. John of the Cross. I just want to advertise him because he wrote extensively about the benefits of detachment, but that word can get misunderstood. When St. John wrote about detachment, again, he wrote about it a lot. From everything, detachment, from every, we don't, we're not needing, wanting, lusting after, pursuing or prioritizing that which is not God or not from God. And the real word, the, the, to understand St. John and detachment, it's about prioritizing. I'm not going to prioritize. I'm not going to make my primary pursuit that which is not God or not from God. He was a, an early author of the removal of everything that hinders love. He was serious about that, about going to war on the inside, about purging the selfishness that destroys Trinitarian love. This removal of everything that hinders love, enabling the fullness of joy in our union with him. When we're joyfully detached, we're going, no, Lord, I don't, I don't need what you don't give me. I don't need what you don't give me. It starts, Paul said in 1 Timothy 6, with food and clothing. With food and clothing, I'll be content. I'm going to trust you for the basics. But then from there, whatever you add to my life or take away or withhold, I'm good. I don't, I don't need what you don't give me. I'm in. I'm in for the journey. And St. John's whole point was, as we lean into that way of living our life, we're actually opening up our heart to genuine joy, fulfillment, satisfaction, and pleasure, because now we're making room. We are actually removing in little moments, like, no, I don't need that. No, I don't want that. No, I don't care about that. But really, even better, we're going, Lord, help me. Change my heart so that it opens more to the pleasure of being with you versus the way in which my heart reaches for the stuff that doesn't satisfy. That's the true death to self that comes 
from embracing the cross. Let's stand.